All right, so we can go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Uh, good for y'all for studying for this exam. I know it's pretty nice that it comes up so quickly. But the good news is that because there's only like four days worth of material, there's less you have to keep track of. So for some of you, that's a good thing. Uh, I know that um, it came really quickly, but it's less to deal with. So hopefully that helps. And don't forget, uh, we have a final on next week on Friday. So, you know, of course, study for this exam, but, but make sure you're gearing up to study everything. And I'm gonna try to do this presentation um, in kind of helping for the final as well, just so you get that uh, bit of assistance there. Um, so yeah, so the way I usually organize these things is I tend to just have a bunch of material. Um, it's basically just a really quick rundown of everything we've talked about in this unit, uh, things that I think are the big ideas, the big picture concepts. And at any point, please stop me. Please stop me and ask questions. But I think it helps a lot if you, let's say you have a question about the pancreas, for example, maybe ask that question when we get to the pancreas. Um, that help us kind of build this story about uh, these physiological systems, which as you all have seen, building the story is so important. Um, can we turn off the chime? If I can figure out how to do that, then yes. I don't know, I don't know if I can here, so sorry about that. There will be a bit of a review for the final. We're still kind of working out the details, I think we're gonna come up with something just for the reproductive unit so that you can watch all these other lecture videos or all these other review videos um, in order to study for those parts of the final. Because the review videos are great in that sense because they hit the big picture concepts, which is what the final is trying to do. Um, and then the final, Dr. Walrund will try to pull together a lot of concepts. So you might see something about epithelium, but Lo and behold, epithelium is in almost every single physiological system we talk about. So you might see a question about epithelium related to the kidneys or related to the GI tract. Um, so yeah, so I've seen the exam. Don't think you're gonna get any answers or anything out of me, but I definitely wanna make this worth your time. So uh, please ask questions, please um, stop me, but otherwise I'm just gonna kind of truck along and get through the material and Whenever we're done, we're done. Um, I'll try to keep it a few hours, but if we go over, we go over. You don't have to stick around the whole time. Um, it'll be recorded and posted in its entirety. So if you miss something at the end, you can always go back. All right, well, without further ado, we can go ahead and get started. So the first thing I wanna to talk to you about today is epithelium. Um, and that's because I think the epithelium is one of the most important. Um, one of the most important concepts in this entire class because it gives you a structural organization of the body. It helps you define how the body is organized in a very basic sense, but that's sometimes really, really crucial to understanding how these physiological systems work. Um, where are the unit video, recorded videos at? I actually don't know, but um, we'll make sure we send out an announcement with all that information so you have all of it um, as soon as we possibly can. I'll talk to them about it tonight. So the epithelium, as you all know, has an apical side and it has a basilar side. And on the basilar side is a basal lamina. Um, this is the Walren style diagram. You all probably really familiar with this by now, but what, what does it mean? And I think the common thing we like to say is that apical is facing the outside and basilar is facing inside. So I want you to imagine a donut. This will make sense in a sec. If you take a donut, a donut that has a hole in it and you cut it in half, I would ask you, where is the inside of the donut? And if I was forced to answer this question, I would say the part of the donut that's actually, you know, inside the donut, this kind of tan colored stuff right here, that's inside the donut. Whereas the stuff that's in the hole of the donut, it's not really inside the donut. Now I know that's ridiculous, but if we put an epithelium here, we might say that the apical side is facing the outside world and the basilar side is facing the inside of the donut, but the whole of the donut is not the inside of the donut. 
maybe maybe you all understand this already so i apologize if this is redundant but you basically are just a really complicated donut in fact you belong to an entire category you and i belong to an entire category of organisms that began life as a tube as basically nothing more than a hollow tube with the mouth at one end and the anus at the other end and it's important to think about the things that course through your digestive tract maybe the the stuff that's inside your ep exocrine glands, that's outside of your body. It may not be physically outside of your body, but it's outside of the part of your body that contains bones and, and um, connective tissue. So it, it's important to realize this concept. And if I was to place epithelium at any given point in this body diagram, I might say, okay, here's an apical side facing the outside world, here's a basilar side. That makes sense, skin is pretty simple, but if we look inside, let's say the nasal cavity, the apical side is facing the inside of the nasal cavity and the basilar side is facing your body. And I don't wanna belabor this point too much, I think you all get it. Um, in the lungs, the apical side is facing the air, dot, 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 you know, GI tract, same idea. So if something is touching the apical side of your body, sorry, if something is touching the apical side of an epithelium, you have to do something to it if you want it to actually be in your body. Otherwise, it's probably going to leave somehow. And that is that concept has come up in many of the physiological systems we've talked about. So that's enough of that. Here's a, a little more um, detailed epithelium for you. And I want to emphasize that on the basilar side of an epithelium, there's almost always a capillary. Remember that no part of the body is really without capillaries. The capillaries are necessary because they supply energy and nutrients and all that good stuff to any given cell type. So you would never find a capillary on the apical side of an epithelium. So if you ever lost, if you ever like, oh God, wh what side's the apical side, what side's the basilar side? Look for where you would find a capillary. That's the basilar side. You wouldn't have a blood vessel inside you know, your alveoli. That just wouldn't make sense. Um, so the basilar side is anchored to the underlying connective tissue with this thing called a basal lamina, which just means layer on the basilar side. So that's an epithelium. And notice I haven't said we're talking about renal or digestive yet. Those concepts apply to pretty much any physiological system, but they're important to emphasize here. There are a couple different routes we can take across the epithelium. To say transcellular is to say crossing both the in the basilar membranes. You're kind of transversing the, the membranes of the cell. And we'll see a lot of cases where transcellular transport comes up. To say paracellular is to say around the cells. That's what that word means. So we're talking about transport of things that goes between the cells through pathways made by tight junctions. And usually only water and ions are, are small enough or selected for in this pathway. So if there's these you know, really tight, tight junctions between epithelial cells, sometimes water and ions can get through there. They, they kind of form this little channel. It can be hard to visualize, but imagine it's this little like labyrinth pathway that the water and ions are going through. And that brings us to the renal system. Now we're gonna start with talking about epithelial concepts related to the renal system, but does anyone have any questions before I do that? Okay, feel free to drop them in the chat too if you have them. So the renal system is the kidneys. You know, it's, it's these somewhat boring looking organs that are tucked behind our digestive tract. They often don't get the credit they deserve for how integral they are in body function. And the most important concept here is the concept of osmolality. Osmolality is a really generic way of saying there's a lot of, there's solutes in a solution. The more solutes there are in a given solution, the higher the osmolality of that solution. And this just gets at the idea that water is gonna always wanna move to where there are more solutes. Remember that a solution is made of solutes dissolved in a solvent solvents is always going to be water in biology. So if there's a ton of molecules, let's say on this side, okay. Let me get my laser pointer out. So if there's a ton of molecules on this side and pretty much no molecules on this side, 
then water is going to want to move to where there are more molecules, to where there are more solutes. And we say that this chamber here has a high osmolality. And notice that I'm saying that this semi-permeable membrane only allows water through. So water is going to move to where there's a higher osmolality. And you can actually do this experiment. Um, and you would find pretty much the same thing, which is that if you set this up in the right way, one side will be more full of water or it will have a higher volume because water has moved there. And you know, as, as basic as that sounds, that's pretty much all the kidney really does is it very, very precisely controls where the osmolality is in any given region. And it also helps reabsorb things like um, glucose and amino acids and stuff. But really the kidneys are, are working to modify this thing called ultrafiltrate so that you don't pee out a bunch of stuff that you actually want to keep in your body. So water can move in this paracellular route. This is usually in um, regions like the proximal and the distal convoluted tubules. In fact, I think what we talk about, those are the only two places we talk about water moving in this way. And that is in the paracellular route. And usually what that means is ions are moving you know, into the blood vessels or something. And because the ions are moving, well, the osmolality is gonna be higher where they're moving than where they came from, right? Because if solutes are moving into the blood vessel, they're creating a high osmolality in that blood vessel, water's gonna follow. And that's how you might reabsorb water and water in the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule. And I'll talk about that again in a sec. Water can also move in the so-called transcellular route, but only when there's aquaporin channels, and they have to be on both the apical and the basilar sides of the membrane. If they were only on the apical side, you'd get a bunch of water building up in the cell and it would explode probably. But because you have aquaporins on both sides of this epithelium, water can move all the way from, let's say, inside the nephron, inside the proximal convoluted, sorry, no, inside the collecting duct, let's say, and back into the blood vessels. So those are the two different ways water moves. And again, this is mostly just in the convoluted tubules, whereas this is gonna happen in the collecting duct and the descending limb of the loop of the nephron. So here's you know, a, a big, big picture of all these physiological systems. Um, and I only show you this to remind you that the kidney is one kind of integral part of this really big system here. And something like 20% of the cardiac output is to your kidney. And that's because your kidney's role really is to get rid of stuff. Sometimes it's getting rid of fluid. You know, you, you're constantly recycling fluid in your body. You're constantly getting rid of water and things in water and drinking water again. You know, anyone knows this if you've ever become thirsty and, and gone for a glass of water. And so this process of removing things entirely from the body is known as excretion. We're gonna differentiate between excretion, which is literally removing it from your body entirely, and filtration, which is the movement of, of fluid and blood into the nephron. We'll see that's a bit more precise of a concept here. But so here's the renal artery um, and it's supplying blood to the kidneys. Anytime you see the word renal, or you know, maybe renin or renin, we're talking about kidneys. That's the, the dead giveaway that kidney is the physiological system in question. So here's a more detailed picture of the kidney. Here's that renal artery. It's supplying blood. Um, there are names of these arteries. I don't remember them. I don't, he won't ask you those, but they course up here. You know, they go around these regions called the renal medulla, and then they kind of branch out and over the renal medulla. And then they end as these straight arteries in this region called the renal cortex. So the blood supply to the kidney travels to the renal cortex and cortex just means bark, like the outer bark of a tree. Remember, you know, we ran into this word in the brain where it referred to the outer bark of the brain. So the renal cortex is this outer portion of the kidneys. Um, and this is a kidney that's cut in half. Um, it's bisected so you can look inside it. And so these arteries, end in glomerular capillaries. That is what their job is. They end as glomerular capillaries 
And if you remember how this thing is organized, those glomerular capillaries are tucked inside of Bowman's capsule. So let's look at that. We're gonna zoom in at what's going on up here in this amino medulla that's labeled. And I've drawn just the Bowman's capsule of a bunch of different nephrons. Don't, if this diagram confuses you, don't worry about it. But what I'm trying to show here is that all of these arteries, all these tiny little branches of arteries end in a glomerular capillary and around every single one of those glomerular capillaries is a Bowman's capsule. Now a Bowman's capsule is just one part of a bigger nephron, but it would be impossible for me to draw those nephrons. So I wanted to just show you how many nephrons there can be in any given you know, renal medulla. And this is nowhere near the actual amount, but it gives you a sense of how kind of diverse the system is. So notice a couple of these have arrows and I'm gonna actually switch to the next slide and it's gonna show those nephrons. Um, and remember, these are the Bowman's capsules. That's the first part of the nephron, the part of the nephron that surrounds the glomerular capillary blood vessel. So those Bowman's capsules kind of turned into their entire nephrons. And this allows us to differentiate between two types of nephron. Remember, each Bowman's capsule is the beginning of the nephron. The two major types of nephron we're gonna talk about are the cortical nephrons that exist mostly up here in the renal cortex and the juxtaglomerular nephrons. The juxtaglomerular neph, sorry, the juxta medullary nephrons. I said that wrong, uh, so let me correct myself. The juxta medullary nephrons are gonna be juxta or right next to the renal medulla down here. These are the ones that we talk about mostly because they're the ones that help concentrate urine and things like that. And so these juxta medullary nephrons, although they have their proximal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule in the renal cortex, they dive their loop of Henle or loop of the nephron as deep as they can down into the renal medulla. And we'll see why that is. These are gonna be the ones we care about more because these are the ones that can concentrate urine. Um, now, I wanna reiterate that you're always gonna find the proximal and the distal convoluted tubule in the renal cortex. It's only the loop of the nephron that actually dives down into the renal medulla or not. There are some nephrons that don't even do that at all because they don't need to concentrate. Um, urine. But again, we don't talk about those because they're simple. You know, we just put fluid into the nephron and it's pretty much gone um, besides the stuff that happens in the convoluted tubules. All right, so those are nephrons. We're going to focus on one. I won't, I won't make you keep track of multiple at once. So here's a nephron. Um, let's just follow the blood supply. Here's blood supply coming from the blood supply coming from the renal artery. It's gonna end up here. And I, that was dumb of me. I kind of covered it with this arrow, but there's a blood vessel delivering blood to the glomerular capillary inside here, which is tucked inside this Bowman's capsule. And this entire structure here is known as the renal corpuscle. Um, so the renal corpuscle is the, the, functional name of these two structures together. Are the pyramids what then the loops of the nephrons? I think for the most part they are. There's a lot of interstitial space too, which we'll talk about. That's where um, ions and, and solutes and things like urea are kept. But yeah, for the most part, I think the majority of that volume is taken up by the loops of the nephrons, which gives you a sense of how many there are or how many there must be in those pyramid, in those uh, renal medulla. If I say pyramids, it's because they're also called renal pyramids, just because they're kind of triangle shaped. So there's the renal corpuscle. Now I'm going to zoom into that so we can actually see what's going on in there. But I want you to see the big picture first, which is that blood is supplied to this glomerular capillary in an effort to move a lot of that fluid into Bowman's capsule during the process of filtration. So we're going to take that renal corpuscle and I'm going to kind of bring it up bigger. So here's the renal corpuscle. Sorry, when I turn on the laser pointer, it makes my computer freak out. Okay, there we go. So here's the renal corpuscle. We have an afferent arterial. This is the one coming from the renal artery that's delivering blood to this glomerular capillary. And if, if you want to imagine blood kind of going in this direction, 
goes through here like this. I meant to make this clear that there was like a tunnel here so the blood can go all the way through. Um, and then it exits by way of the efferent arterial. You've come across these words before. Afferent means to go towards and efferent means to go away from. It doesn't necessarily have to do with the, the neuronal circuits and stuff. Just think of the glomerular capillary as the point of reference. So the afferent arterial goes to it and the efferent arterial goes away from it. And off of that efferent arterial, you get all those complicated you know, capillary beds that Dr. Wallern talked about, the peritubular capillaries and the vasorecta. The importance of that is simply to say that there's always, always, always going to be a blood vessel pretty darn close to the basilar side of this epithelium. So that when you're in the proximal convoluted tubule, let's say, there's a peritubular capillary just underneath that basal lamina of those epithelial cells. And you'll see that when we talk about each portion in and of itself. But all of those blood vessels are arising from this exit point from this efferent arterial. And that's great because if something like glucose, you know, came out of the glomerular capillary and went into Bowman's capsule, you still want that in your blood. So the blood vessels come right up next to it. So you can just kind of put it back in there. And that's the process of reabsorption. So this is the glomerular capillary, or sorry, this is Bowman's capsule surrounding the glomerular capillary, which is altogether the renal corpuscle. So the movement of fluid from inside this capillary into Bowman's capsule is called filtration. And the fluid after it enters the Bowman's capsule is known as ultra filtrate. It's super filtrated. Um, you know, a lot of stuff does get through these little slits here, but most of um, the blood is still in the glomerular capillary, especially, <coughs> excuse me, especially things like erythrocytes, red blood cells, and these big plasma proteins that are just way too big to fit through these little um, avenues here. I should say at this point that the glomerular capillary is made of a fenestrated endothelium, which is to say there are windows in this endothelium, as you can kind of see here. Um, so things can get through from inside the blood vessels out into the outside the blood vessels, so to speak. And then the, the cells that surround the glomerular capillary, these are simply epithelial cells of Bowman's capsule. They're kind of weird looking. That was that first picture I showed you for the renal system. Um, so I tried to demonstrate that here, but really they're just made of kind of the same deal. Uh, there's just all these little slits so that things can get through there. So what are the pressures dictating this fluid movement? And I, I'm not showing the glomerular capillary here because this applies to really any physiological system. When the heart beats, it generates a blood pressure. That's why we say, you know, your blood pressure is 120 over 80. 120 is the pressure of systole or systolic ejection. And that is literally pushing the fluid in the blood vessels against the walls of these blood vessels. And that is called the hydrostatic pressure. So the pressure exerted by that pumping of the heart is gonna force some fluid out. But because a lot of things still exist inside this capillary, like these big plasma proteins that um, are too big to fit through those slits. I didn't draw this right. You know, they actually can fit through there, but pretend they can't. Um, remember that water is gonna follow wherever there is a certain amount of osmolality. And it just so happens that, you know, in the kidney, for example, when you move a bunch of fluid from the glomerular capillary into Bowman's capsule, you're kind of concentrating the, the fluid inside the glomerular capillary. You're getting rid of a lot of water inside that capillary. And so its osmolality is increasing as you go through the glomerular capillary. And that's gonna exert what's called an oncotic pressure, which is another fancy dumb way of saying osmolality. We're saying that the, the capillary has a high osmolality. And so it's gonna pull some water back in because water follows solutes. So let's put that in the context of our renal corpuscle here. Well, as the fluid moves through, again, it has that hydrostatic pressure. So it's gonna push some fluid out. I'm not giving you the numbers here because I think the concept's more important. It's 55 millimeters of mercury, but suffice it to say, it's pushing fluid out through these filtration slits as they're called between the 
you know, the holes in the endothelium and then the holes in the um, epithelium of Bowman's capsule. But again, there's going to be a certain oncotic pressure, especially closer to the end of the efferent arterial, because as the fluid has exited throughout this glomerular capillary, you're increasing and increasing and increasing the osmolality inside the blood vessel here, inside the glomerular capillary. So it's going to pull some water back in. And finally, and this one's a little more tricky, when you put fluid in Bowman's capsule, it's only so big. Um, it, can't, it can't accommodate unlimited amount of fluid. And it's a little bit elastic, so it's going to kind of recoil somewhat like an alveolus, but don't go too much into that analogy. It's just going to kind of recoil a little bit. And that is referred to as the Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure. It's just going to put a little bit more fluid back in the glomerular capillary. That all being said, there is a net filtration, which is to say the amount of fluid moved out thanks to hydrostatic pressure is greater than the amount of fluid moved in thanks to both of these other inward forces. So there is a net filtration, meaning more fluid is pushed out of the glomerular capillary than is pulled back in. And hopefully that makes sense. I can't, I like turned the mathematical operation around a bit, but this is greater than this plus this. And that is what drives filtration. And again, a lot of stuff is filtered. Things like glucose, uh, amino acids, a lot of ions, and a lot, a lot of water, and a bunch of other stuff that we're not going to talk about. Those are the major players because you don't really want to get rid of all your ions. You don't really want to get rid of sugars and amino acids. What you want to get rid of is the fluid. But in order to get rid of the fluid, you have to push some fluid into this nephron. So the nephron is, is this intricately designed system simply for kind of recapturing a lot of that stuff putting that stuff back into the blood vessels so that it's not excreted or removed entirely to the outside world. So here's the nephron. I'm gonna go through this really quickly just as a big picture kind of deal, but then we're gonna go through each part of it um, one by one. Something in the chat. Is oncotics completely synonymous with osmotic or is it a distinction? There is a distinction. I wouldn't worry about it. If you want to sit there and say it's basically osmolality or osmotic pressure, that's fine. Um, I think that's that's more of a, to use a Walrand phrase, getting into the weeds of it type thing. That's not really necessary to understand the concept. So here's the nephron. Um, sorry, laser pointer, there we go. And so we're pointing at the Bowman's capsule. I'm really, I did that wrong. It's pointing at the glomerular capillary, but it's pointing at the, the first part of the nephron, which is that Bowman's capsule. That's the site of filtration. In the proximal convoluted tubule, the convoluted tubule that's closest to the beginning of the nephron, that's what proximal means, you reabsorb glucose and amino acids, meaning you take the glucose and amino acids that are inside the lumen of the nephron and you put them back into the blood vessels. In the descending limb of the loop of the nephron, which is really this whole descending limb, you see the reabsorption of water and the concentration of ultrafiltrate. And those two things go hand in hand because if you remove water from inside the nephron, you're making the concentration of solutes inside the nephron greater and greater and greater because you're getting rid of the solvent, right? So you're, you're decreasing the denominator, so the entire fraction is increasing. That is um, the concentration of the ultrafiltrate. Once you round the hairpin turn of the nephron all the way down kind of near the renal pelvis, which is the opening, um, you have a really high osmolality inside the nephron. So then as you ascend and you face an, a lower concentration of solutes up here, you're gonna see ions moving out of the nephron and going back into the blood vascular system or into the interstitial space, same deal. Um, and in the thin segment, you're passively reabsorbing ions. And in the thick segment, you are actively reabsorbing ions. But again, you know, it's because you concentrated the ultrafiltrate so much here 
like there's a certain driving force moving filtrate the ultrafiltrate out back into the blood vessels. And here's the distal convoluted tubule up here. You're gonna see sodium reabsorption under control of aldosterone, which is just when your blood volume drops a little, you're gonna see aldosterone in your bloodstream. That's part of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And by reabsorbing sodium, you're actually also reabsorbing water because water is gonna follow solutes. In the collecting duct, which is not technically part of the nephron, um, you're gonna see sodium reabsorption or uh, water reabsorption under control of ADH or antidiuretic hormone. And that's gonna be released in your bloodstream when you're thirsty. So it would make sense if you're thirsty, you're gonna to wanna to reabsorb water. You're gonna to wanna to take it out of the nephron and put it back into your bloodstream because otherwise you'd get rid of it. And then it's kind of going against the, the concept of thirst. So what is sensing the need to release renin and aldosterone? I'll talk about that in a little bit. So hold on to that question. And if I don't answer it, uh, let me know again. So this is a basic overview of what the kidney is doing. And for any given thing, be it water, sodium, uh, glucose, amino acids, you can describe how much is filtered, how much is reabsorbed, how much is secreted, which really doesn't happen a lot, and how much is excreted. So you filter pretty much, you know, most of the glucose that's in the bloodstream that arrives at the kidney, but then you reabsorb most of it. So you actually don't excrete much glucose at all. If you are excreting glucose, that means you're not really doing things right. Um, that's the problem that a lot of people have with diabetes where they have just so much sugar in their bloodstream that their nephron can't handle it. And so they excrete a bunch of sugar. So you filter, you reabsorb, you secrete, and you excrete. And we're not gonna talk much about secretion at all. But this is the basic idea. You know, if something is left in the nephron, once the nephron reaches the collecting duct, and you know, once the collecting duct empties into the renal pelvis, if it gets there, it's gone. There's no recapturing it at that point. So the, the point of the nephron in the collecting duct is to make sure that you're recapturing all this stuff. And that is how we modify the ultrafiltrate. And if we look at what's going on in this renal medulla or renal pyramid, we might find something called the corticomedullary gradient. The corticomedullary gradient is exactly what it sounds like. It's a gradient that goes from the renal cortex and increases down deep in the renal medulla, hence corticomedullary. What these numbers are representing is the concept of osmolality, which is saying there's a higher osmolality down here in the interstitial space than there is up here. Um, higher osmolality closer to, the, uh, closer to the renal pelvis and a lower osmolality closer to the renal cortex. And it stands to reason that as things are going through the nephron or through the collecting duct, they're facing an ever greater concentration of things, regardless of what that is. It's a lot of urea. Urea is made of the uh, made in the liver and transported to the renal medulla for this reason. So it can concentrate really heavily down here deep in the renal medulla and give you this high osmolality. Notice I'm putting this osmolality outside of the nephron, outside of the collecting duct, because this concentration exists on the basilar side of that epithelium, both in the blood vessels and just in the interstitial space. The blood vessels are pretty much open, so they can kind of exchange things with the interstitial space willy-nilly. But all of that is to say that if we take a look at our epithelium, and you kind of think back to your epithelium, and there was that basilar side, on that basilar side is where this osmolality exists. And up here, it's not very great, but way down deep in the medulla, it's really large. And that is gonna be how we concentrate urine and we'll talk about how that works with this um, juxtamedullary nephron. So let's start in the proximal convoluted tubule. So let's get my laser pointer out. And again, these slides, you have these slides. So if um, I'm going too fast for you, please tell me, but also uh, you can look at the details later if you need. So this is the inside of the proximal convoluted tubule up here on the apical side you don't want glucose and amino acids to keep going through the nephron on the apical side. You wanna move them into the cell 
and then move them across the basilar membrane into the bloodstream. So on the apical side, you have a glucose sodium co-transporter, which is simply saying in the ultrafiltrate, there's a lot of sodium. So we might as well use that gradient to help pull in some glucose into the cell. On the basilar side, you have passive glucose or passive amino acid channels. And those are moving those monomers, those monomeric nutrients back into the bloodstream. Now these cells probably have both of these transporters. I don't mean to say that there are some glucose cells and some amino acid cells. Suffice it to say, they're very similar processes. They're using co-transporters on the apical side, passive diffusion transporters on the basilar side. And that makes a lot of sense because if you move glucose into the cell, glucose is gonna have a high concentration inside the cell. So it's gonna move from high to low concentration into the blood vessels. And then you have a sodium potassium ATPase you're almost always, always, always gonna find the sodium potassium ATPase on the basilar side. Because the things on the apical side are just whizzing by too quickly for the sodium potassium ATPase to work. It's a pretty slow enzyme. So you're almost always gonna find them on the basilar side. And the importance of that is if you put sodium into the cell, eventually you would build up sodium and that wouldn't be good because you would get rid of this gradient that sodium has in wanting to move into the cell. So then you kick that sodium back out of the cell on the basilar side, maintaining a low sodium concentration inside the cell so that sodium keeps wanting to flow in. And everything I've talked about here for glucose also applies to amino acids. It's almost the exact same process, but just getting a different monomeric nutrient into the blood vessels. Again, that's awesome because you reabsorb glucose, you reabsorb amino acids. They're not being peed out to the outside world which is the goal here. So let's then move on to, oh, and another thing, water follows. Remember that water likes this paracellular route in the convoluted tubules. So it's gonna follow the movement of sodium and glucose and amino acids, because you're building the osmolality in here. So what then happens in the descending limb of the loop of the nephron? Well, as fluid moves down the descending limb, it's facing a greater and greater and greater concentration of solutes in the interstitial space. So focus on what's going on right here. Here's the interstitial space. You're diving down deep into the renal medulla and the osmolality is increasing as you do so. So water is gonna to wanna to move to where there's a higher osmolality. Let's say the osmolality of the nephron is 300 here and it's 400 here water is going to move to where it's 400. Well, you've slightly concentrated the inside of the nephron, the fluid, the ultrafiltrate moves. And then once you get down here where it's, you know, 600 or 500, it's continually moving to where there's a higher osmolality. I could have organized these numbers a little better, but there's always a bit higher osmolality in the interstitial space. But because as you move water out of the nephron, the inside of the nephron becomes more concentrated which is why we say that the nephron comes to equilibrium with the interstitial space here, because fluid is continually moving to the interstitial space. And these are aquaporin-1 channels. We'll see later that um, these are always there. You always have these channels working. They're not like just there when you're thirsty. Whereas in the collecting duct, aquaporin-2 channels, which do pretty much the same exact thing, their main difference is that they're upregulated when you're thirsty. So you can actually control that with your brain, whereas this is just kind of a steady state. They're there, I think, forever for a good amount of time. So you've rounded the hairpin turn. You know, we've entered the ascending limb of the loop of the nephron. Now I've put the basilar side on this side just to kind of reflect that. But still, here's the inside of your nephron. You have high osmolality and you're passively diffusing ions now out back into the interstitial space. As you ascend the ascending limb of the loop of the nephron, you're facing a lower and lower and lower osmolality in the interstitial space. And so ions are gonna to wanna to move from high concentration to low concentration. That's a pretty simple concentration gradient. No water can move here. Notice that there's no aquaporins at all. So no water is moving in the ascending limb. And 
I've kind of blocked out the paracellular routes here to show you that paracellular transport is not possible in the ascending limited loop of methyl. So that's the idea here. Once you get up into the thick segment, um, you actually want to not depend entirely on the gradient here. You want to actively pump ions back into the blood. And that's where this apical sodium potassium 2 chloride or NAK2Cl transporter comes in. That's going to actively pump ions into the cells. And then you're going to get all kinds of transporters, you know, either sodium potassium ATPs or just passive diffusion transporters helping to move things back into the blood vascular system. Again, the whole point of this is just to actively reabsorb a bunch of ions. And notice here that the osmolality is really, really decreased once you reach the descending limit of the loop of the nephron. That's the goal, right? You wanna have a really low osmolality and a really low volume because that means you've reabsorbed both water and the ions and molecules and solutes, glucose and amino acids that were in water. So that's the goal here. And then finally, or I guess not finally, but we get to the, the distal convoluted tubule where you see sodium reabsorption. But again, this is under control of aldosterone. So we'll talk about that again in a sec, but aldosterone is there when your blood volume is a little low. And that just helps you to reabsorb water because water is going to follow that sodium. And this is where that ENAC channel comes in, the epithelial sodium channel, um, which is what that stands for. That is going to be on the apical side of only the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, I see something in the chat. Are both NAKTCL channels and sodium potassium ATPase as active channels? Yes, they are both active channels. So they need ATP. So you, you got to have a lot of ATP in these cells. Okay. So that's the distal convoluted tubule. Again, I'm going to reiterate this. Remember, I've seen the exam, so I know which things to reiterate. You got to keep track of these channels. Um, try to keep track of the consistent things across them. I've tried to color code them so that, you know, passive ion channels are always going to be teal, so that might help. Um, but focus on the special ones, like the, the ENAX and the sodium potassium to chloride channels. And remember that um, this paracellular route of water is mostly going to be the case up here in the renal cortex, up in the convoluted tubules. Whereas in the collecting duct and the descending limb loop and nephron, you see the transcellular transport of water, which is with aquaporins. So again, here's the collecting duct. Um, this is where you get more water reabsorption. It's very, very similar to what happens in the descending limb. You know, again, you're facing high osmolalities, and so water is going to want to move more so the deeper you get, right? Because you're facing an ever increasing osmolality. But this aquaporin two is regulated by that antidiuretic hormone. So antidiuresis is not peeing. So this, the, this hormone, this peptide hormone, is the hormone that you use if you don't want to pee out a bunch of water. And what this hormone does is upregulate these aquaporin too so that you can reabsorb water so that you don't pee it, pee it all out. That's the antidiuresis part of that hormone. And if you don't have that hormone, let's say you just drank a bunch of water, you're not thirsty, you actually want to get rid of some water, then you don't have those aquaporin twos. Water just goes straight down through the collecting duct and into the renal pelvis. And again, once it's in the renal pelvis, it's gone to the outside world. There's no recapturing it. So that is the end of the nephron plus collecting duct story. And now all I want to talk about is how, why this all matters and how you can modulate it. So remember that there are juxtamedullary nephrons. These are the ones that dive down deep into the renal, cor renal medulla. And at this point, <coughs> you should be able to say why that would help you concentrate your urine. Whereas this cortical nephron isn't really going to do that because it doesn't dive down deep into the renal medulla. You don't force water in the nephron to face those huge concentrations of urea, which was made in the liver and, and ions and other solutes. So that's the, the 
great thing about these juxta medullary nephrons, the ones that are juxta near the medulla. So, and this is just for fun, you know, if you want to go back to this, great. Two animals, yellow-thighed finches live in tropical areas where water is abundant, and these kangaroo mice live in deserts where water is scarce. Which do you think has more juxtamedullary nephrons, and which do you think has more cortical nephrons? And I want to tell you the answer because I want you to work through it. Um, but if you want to send me your answer to our CSU BMS 300 email later, I can give you feedback. So how do you control the system? Well, there's four ways. And at the end of this, I'm gonna show you a really great uh, table that Abby put together that I think is the best way to organize this stuff. But first I wanna talk through each one. So tubulo glomerular feedback. That is an important phrase because it tells you you're getting feedback from the distal convoluted tubule, that's the tubulo part, all the way back to the glomerulus, which is why the distal convoluted tubule gets so close to the glomerular capillary. You have aldosterone, which is really part of this renin-angiotensin system, and you have vasopressin, which is gonna be released when you're thirsty. So let's start with tubulo glomerular feedback. Well, in order to do so, we have to talk about glomerular filtration rate. I know there's a lot of words here, but just think about the fact that the rate at which you filter things is gonna determine how quickly you get rid of fluid. That hopefully should be intuitive, but you can regulate that. So if you don't wanna get rid of fluid, you might undergo changes to decrease your glomerular filtration rate. Um, if you wanna get rid of fluid, you might undergo changes to increase your glomerular filtration rate. So one of the things that can do this is tubulo glomerular feedback. In your distal convoluted tubule here, this has already gone through that whole process of, uh, um, you know, reabsorbing sodium and reabsorbing glucose and amino acids and PCT all the way through the loops. Once you enter the first part of this distal convoluted tubule, the macula densa cells, which are simply the epithelial cells of that distal convoluted tubule, monitor how much sodium is in the filtrate. Remember that the goal was to get a really low sodium concentration in the filtrate at the distal convoluted tubule because you want to reabsorb it. You don't want to be peeing out a bunch of sodium. So if the macula densa cells here, and this is before aldosterone, this is before the rest of the distal convoluted tubule well, where aldosterone can help reabsorb a little bit more of that sodium. If the distal convoluted tubule notices there's too much sodium in the filtrate, what that might mean is that the stuff is flowing through the nephron too quickly. It's not having enough time to be transported back into the blood vessels through things like those passive channels or maybe you know, the, the NAK2CL transporters. And if that's the case, then these macula densa cells will release, some, release something called adenosine. Sometimes it's actually just ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. And adenosine acts in what is called a paracrine fashion. Again, you know, if you remember from the first unit, paracrine is just next to. It's going to release adenosine onto these smooth muscle cells that surround the afferent arterial, and they're going to constrict that afferent arterial, thereby limiting the amount of blood that can get to the glomerular capillary, and that would effectively decrease glomerular filtration rate. So it's just really simple feedback mechanism that says there's too much sodium in the DCT distal convoluted tubule, things are moving too quickly, the glomerular filtration rate is too high, and if we constrict this blood vessel, you know, we've talked ad nauseum about all the different ways you can change the amount of flow through a vessel, that would drastically limit how much blood gets to this glomerular capillary, thereby decreasing how much is filtered in any given point in time. So that's tubular glomerular feedback. It's pretty self-contained here. There's no endocrine anything really. It's just kind of happening right at the source there. And that again, tubulo glomerular feedback. It's important. It's a good exercise to kind of dissect that word and figure out what it means. So antidiuretic hormone. I already kind of talked about this, but again, diuresis is increased production of urine, which is mostly water. ADH decreases diuresis. It decreases the peeing out of water by increasing reabsorption of water in the collecting duct. 
and it does so by the aptly named antidiuretic hormone, it's triggered by the same things that trigger thirst, right? So if your blood volume drops, if your sodium content in your blood is too high, which again, that also kind of affects all these other regulatory systems, but that one of the things that that does is cause antidiuretic hormone to be released from your neurons in your posterior pituitary gland into your bloodstream that travels to the kidneys. And if ADH is present, your body wants to hold on to that water. You want an antidiuresis. And so you're going to upregulate these aquaporin twos. Remember that aquaporin twos can be regulated by ADH, whereas the ones, the aquaporin ones in the descending limb can't be. They're always there. But these are regulated by ADH, which is regulated by thirst. And again, you know, this is not any different than the slides I already kind of showed you. If ADH is not present, your body doesn't need to hold on to that water. There's no aquaporin twos on these apical and basilar membranes. So water has no incentive to move across this transcellular route and it can just go down into the renal pelvis and it's gone. And finally, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This seems kind of convoluted, but it, it flows in a nice pattern here. So if you experience a drop in blood volume, we like to use the example of a significant drop in blood volume, but really any drop in blood volume would do this. The juxtaglomerular cells in your kidney will release renin. And I realize I didn't write that anywhere, I'm sorry, but, but juxtaglomerular means right next to the glomerulus. So they're sometimes called JG cells. They're just right next to the glomerular capillary. They can recognize if there's a drop in blood volume and they release renin, or I guess it's technically renin because it's in the renal system, into the blood vessels. So it's an endocrine hormone. It's actually a proteolytic enzyme. While that's happening, the liver is making angiotensinogen. So let's dissect that word. Angio means tube, tense means constrict, and inogen means it's an inactive precursor. So because renin's a proteolytic enzyme, what it actually does is it cleaves the inogen part off. It cleaves something off that turns it from an inogen to angiotensin one. So renin, again, is this proteolytic enzyme. It might even be wrong to call it a hormone but it's a proteolytic enzyme that travels in the bloodstream and converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Is it a hormone? It is a hormone because it travels in the bloodstream. That angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 by ACE. And this is ACE2, I think. No, this is ACE1, whereas ACE2 was the one we saw um, with COVID. Don't worry about that. We're talking about angiotensin converting enzyme here, which is converting angiotensin one to angiotensin two. And once you have angiotensin two, you get two things from that. You get vasoconstriction, which you could assume because angiotensin means tube constrict, and that's gonna increase blood pressure because you're decreasing the amount of space that blood has to occupy. But that angiotensin two is also gonna travel to the adrenal glands, it's going to cause the release of aldosterone, and aldosterone is going to go to the distal convoluted tubule, upregulate those ENACs, and cause sodium reabsorption, which also causes water reabsorption. And I'll show you that in the next slide, just a reminder. But that is the really convoluted system by which we respond to a drop in blood um, volume and pressure. And again, all of that is responding to a drop in blood pressure, and its result is to increased blood pressure. It's a bit of a homeostasis here. I'm seeing something in the chat. So renin is, is an enzyme and angiotensin is a hormone. Um, they're both traveling in the bloodstream. So they both travel in an endocrine fashion. So I would argue that all of this stuff that's traveling in the blood vessel here is a hormone in some capacity. It's important though to note that renin is an active proteolytic enzyme. It's just kind of unique. Proteolytic enzymes don't tend to travel in the bloodstream too much, although I'm sure there's a lot of exceptions to that. But, but it's important to note that it cleaves angiotensinogen and turns it into angiotensin one. Awesome. 
And then aldosterone is a steroid hormone. You can get that from the name sterone. Um, so Dr. Warren loves this. If you can tell us the difference between how a peptide hormone would act on a cell and how a steroid hormone would act on a cell, you know, whether we're talking about GPCRs or steroid receptors in the cytoplasm, you are golden. That's a good, uh, good thing to make sure you know. And if you need more explanation on that, let me know. So yeah, that's the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It makes sense why vasoconstriction would increase blood pressure. Again, the point of aldosterone is to increase these ENACs in the distal convoluted tubule. That allows sodium to go all the way into the blood vessels. That allows you to reabsorb some sodium in the distal convoluted tubule, especially if your blood volume drops. And that causes water reabsorption as well, because remember, in these convoluted tubules, you're going to see water moving in this parasite a lot. So to summarize, here's a great table that Abby put together, and I almost hit an hour perfectly. So are there any questions about the renal system? That's all I had for the renal system. Uh, yeah, I had like a question about that hormone, uh, the, the difference between, between the, the steroid hormone or the peptide hormone. Could you go over that one more time? Yeah, so a peptide hormone is a big protein, hence the name peptide hormone. So peptides in general can't just freely diffuse through membranes. I don't really think there's any examples of that happening. Um, so in order for a peptide hormone to affect its target cell, it needs to interact with a surface receptor, usually something like a GPCR or maybe a, um, an ionotropic receptor and maybe some random cases. But the idea is that the peptide hormone can't just like cozy on into the cell willy-nilly and interact with cytoplasmic receptors. Therefore, it needs to have a surface receptor on the target cell to bind to. Whereas a steroid hormone, steroids are hydrophobic, which is an, another way to say that is they're lipophilic. They like lipids, they don't like water. So steroid hormones like aldosterone can just freely diffuse into any given cell that they interact with. And so they interact with cytoplasmic receptors. So if a question is asked of you, would this steroid hormone interact with the GPCR, you can say it wouldn't need to because it can just freely diffuse into the cell and go find itself a cytoplasmic receptor to bind to. So that's the idea there. It comes up in pretty much every unit, which is why I didn't wanna to make too much of a big deal um, so that you didn't think it was like a special kidney thing, but that's the idea. All right, are there any more questions about the kidneys? And if you can't form your question yet, but you know you have one, uh, feel free to email us later. Um, I wanna try to shift gears in my brain, talk about the digestive system. So, all right, let me check the chat. How's, we have a question about the timing of the exam. The exam will be open, um, the exam will be open the same time frame as every other exam you've taken so far. The different one might be the final, but don't worry about that yet. Awesome. And how is the pace for everyone? Am I going too quickly? I don't wanna trudge along here, but I also don't wanna just rapid fire scream at you. Okay. And again, these slides are, are there for you, but don't think that if you don't look at them, like you're, you're screwed. These slides are containing no information that you haven't gotten from lecture. So this is just my way of synthesizing this stuff in a bit more kind of rapid paced, <laughs> learn it, learn it, learn it. Um, so yeah, awesome. So let's move on to the digestive system. So what we're looking at here is the inside of a, or a artistic representation of the inside of the small intestine which has all these finger-like villi. And I'm gonna ask you later to differentiate between villi and microvilli. But where do we start with the digestive system? So before we even talk about digestion at all, let's talk about molecules. A lot of molecules exist just as molecules. Um, I don't mean to suggest that like every single molecule has a monomer and a polymer. There's some things that are just always gonna be single molecules, but the things that we consider food are polymers. They're polymers made of monomers, 
So a monomer is the fundamental subunit of a polymer um, and only monomers can be absorbed in the small intestine. So it's standard reason that when you eat food, you need to turn it into a monomer. Oligo means few, just like oligodendrocyte means cell with a few branches. So an oligomer is gonna be an association of a few monomers, not large enough to be considered a polymer. Um, this is kind of a loose term. You'll see it used kind of willy-nilly a lot, but dimers and trimers are often the oligomers that we're talking about. And a polymer, which you know in, in food terms is often called a macromolecule or in biology terms, it's often called a macromolecule, is composed of many repeating subunits or monomers. Notice I'm not saying proteins, carbohydrates or anything like that. I'm just saying monomers and polymers. We're gonna talk about each of the four major types of um, macronutrients as they're called and what they're made of. So before we do that though, there are two concepts you need to kind of think about, catabolism and anabolism. Now I'm not gonna make you solve for any free energy, anything like that, you know, no chemistry, but I want you to realize the significance of this. Anabolism is building up molecules. You're doing this right now. You're, you're using all these glucose molecules to build up things like starch so that you can store sugars so that you can use them later on. Um, and catabolism is the breaking down of those polymers into monomers. So you really do a lot of catabolism, you know, both when you're trying to free up your energy stores, but also just in your digestive system. Because remember, if you want to absorb something, if you want to absorb a nutrient, take it from the apical side of your digestive tract and move it to the basilar side, you got to turn it into a monomer with only a few key um, exceptions to that. If you don't do that, you know, that stuff is gone. Um, again, you're just basically this big long food tube, right? And if things make it from one end to the other without being absorbed, something has gone awry. Um, or, you know, glucose has made it, something has gone awry. So you want to digest the stuff all the way down into monomers so that you can absorb it. I think I'm getting ahead of myself. But food is basically just a bunch of macromolecules and, and other stuff you don't want to digest. So the food, yes, that's why it's anabolic steroids. So the food that you eat is made of polymers. The organisms that make up food, which is basically any organism that you eat, has undergone all these anabolic processes to make these macromolecules. You know, a fish was doing that so that it had its own energy stores. You're just kind of poor fish, you're taking its energy stores from it. But the idea is that it built up all these big molecules and that's why you go through the effort of, of seeking out food. And it's not just fish, it's carrots and, and asparagus and whatever else is in this picture. And so because all of these macronutrients are in their polymer form, they have undergone all this anabolism, you need to then use catabolism throughout your digestive tract. So what, what's in food? Mostly just these three major macromolecules. Um, there is nucleic acids, which is the other one, but you don't really, we don't really talk about that. It's not as important. Macromolecules are triglycerides, which are fats, polysaccharides, which are carbs or just sugars, and proteins, which there's not a more colloquial name for those. And then water, there's some essential, what are called micronutrients, things like vitamins that you wanna get out of your digestive system. But besides that, there's just a bunch of other stuff that we'd rather not absorb. And you all know this intuitively, otherwise we'd all be these perfectly, we'd absorb all of our food, but we all know full well that we don't absorb all of our food, which is why we have to go to the bathroom a couple times a day or a week or whatever. So what is food? So triglycerides are fats. And a triglyceride is a, a true polymer. It's a polymer made of a glycerol alcohol covalently linked by ester bonds to three fatty acids. And fatty acids are themselves polymers of these two carbon structures called acetates. So here are some acetates. Um, this is the organic chemistry nomenclature, but every kink in this line is a carbon. So if you break this down into two carbon pieces, all those two carbon pieces are acetates. And you can use these to make ATP, just like you can use sugar to make ATP. It's a bit different, but it's, it's almost the same process. And so in order to digest this stuff, you have to break it down into free fatty acids and acetates. 
and lipid absorption is weird. We'll talk about it, but um, so don't worry about it too much. Polysaccharides or carbohydrates can get a little confusing. There's a lot of names we throw around um, like amylose and amylopectin and cellulose. The most important thing for you to realize is that polymers made of glucose monomers covalently linked are called polysaccharides. Sac is the root for sweet, um, like the term saccharin. And so if you just put a bunch of these glucose molecules together, you get a polysaccharide. And those can exist as either starches or cellulose. Cellulose is undigestible. That's that undigestible fiber you always hear about that helps kind of move things through your digestive tract. It's not broken down in our digestive tract. And it's not broken down because it has what are called um, alpha and beta 1,4 linkages. Alpha linkages, the oxygen um, is down here and beta it's up. Again, don't worry about that. Um, if We're never gonna ask you to talk about the orientation of these things, but realize that because it has that kind of unique conformation, um, we just can't break those covalent bonds with any enzymes that, that we have in our bodies. Whereas amylose and amylopectin have only alpha linkages, both alpha 1,4 linkages and amylopectin has alpha 1,6 linkages. Amylopectin is just a branched form of amylose. If you have just alpha 1,4 linkages, you have amylose. If you have alpha 1,4s and alpha 1,6 linkages, you have amylopectin. Again, don't worry too much about that. We're not gonna ask you to draw any of these chemical structures. The basic point here is that these polysaccharides can exist as either amylose or amylopectin, and you can digest those. You can use your amylase enzymes to break those down into their monomeric forms, which is mostly just glucose. Now, there are also a couple disaccharides that are also in food, and you wanna have enzymes that can digest those as well. Um, so sucrose, maltose, and lactose are the disaccharides that you eat. A disaccharide could be considered an oligosaccharide because it's just a few molecules together. Maltose is very basic. It's just glucose and glucose. Sucrose is glucose and fructose. And lactose is glucose and galactose. Again, don't worry about the chemical structure, but those are some disaccharides we can digest. So we'll see later on that we're gonna have disaccharidases enzymes that break these disaccharides into their monomeric forms, whatever those monomeric forms may be. And finally, we have proteins. Proteins are made of a bunch of amino acids strung together, um, and those are called polypeptide. Again, the nomenclature here gets confusing. Sometimes people say oligopeptides when there's just a couple of them. Sometimes a peptide is not a protein. Um, the way I like to think about it is a bunch of amino acids get together to make a peptide and those peptides fold to form a protein. So you would consider this maybe the primary structure and this the tertiary structure. We're gonna see later there's a oligopeptidase of some type and that's just taking smaller peptides and breaking them down into their individual amino acids. But again, you know, we're just talking about polymers and monomers here. If you want to absorb these nutrients, which is to say move them from inside your digestive tract to actually inside your body so you can use them, travel in your bloodstream, you have to break them down into monomers. So what are the core concepts of digestion? I'm adding, oh, sorry. My chat decided to take up my whole screen and I can't get rid of it. Oh, that's annoying. What in the world? Okay. Okay. So what are the core concepts of gastrointestinal physiology? That's the basic term for all of this. You know, you'll hear gastrointestinal or GI or um, I don't really like that phrase because the mouth and the esophagus are also part of this system, but whatever. So the processes here are secretion, which is movement of things from basilar to apical. Remember, secretion is moving things outside of your body where absorption is moving things inside your body. 
And I've tried to organize these almost in a sequential fashion. Oftentimes, any given portion of your gastrointestinal tract will first secrete things. You will have the processes of mechanical digestion, things like chewing and stomach churning and, and whatever happens in the bulk phase when the villi are kind of battering the enzymes around. You have enzymatic digestion, which is the, the physical breakdown of polymers into smaller and smaller forms, all the way down to monomers. You have absorption, which you can only do if you've already done enzymatic digestion. Absorption is the movement of monomeric nutrients from basilar, sorry, from apical to basilar. So moving things inside your body. This especially happens in the small intestine. And finally, motility. You know, anytime you have any given part of your GI tract, motility seems to be the last thing that happens in order to get that stuff to the next part of your GI tract. So we're gonna go over the GI tract in kind of short form, just like we did for the nephron. I'll go over each of these parts individually, but we start in the mouth, right? You know that, you put food in your mouth, I would hope. And what do you secrete? You secrete water, you secrete ions, you secrete mucus, that just kind of helps soften the food. And you secrete something called salivary amylase. Salivary amylase doesn't really do all that much. It kind of breaks down sugars, but not too much. Um, and some people I, I think don't even have it. But remember secretion, what are we doing? We're moving things into the lumen, which in this case is the mouth. Mechanical digestion then would be chewing. Enzymatic digestion, again, some people have a little bit of breakdown of sugars here. And then what's the motility? The swallowing reflex. Where does it go from there? Well, it goes to the esophagus. Not really much goes on in the esophagus besides motility. You see something called peristalsis. I'll show you an animation of that later, but that moves things all the way down to the stomach. In the stomach, you see secretion of hydrogen ions and pepsinogen, which is what creates pepsin. As that's happening, mechanical digestion is kind of stirring around the stomach contents, mi mixing together that pepsin that you've just created with the food that you've eaten. And the enzymatic digestion is that you break down a lot of those proteins into peptides using this pepsin enzyme. And then what's the motility portion of this? You move chyme from your stomach into your small intestine, specifically into this first part of your small intestine called the duodenum. In the duodenum, you see a lot of pancreatic secretion. We're gonna talk about exactly how this works. We're gonna talk about S cells and I cells, but the basic idea is pretty simple. When food enters your duodenum, your pancreas and your gallbladder say, hey, food is here, let's do something about it. And they secrete pancreatic enzymes like trypsin, chymotrypsin, amylase, and lipase that are gonna break down those polymers into monomers. This is where a lot of that breakdown actually happens. You know, you, you had enzymatic breakdown of proteins in the stomach and a little bit of sugars in the mouth, but this is where the real stuff happens. This is where you really, really break down those polymers. Um, and we'll see that the bile salts from the gallbladder help to, we say, emulsify the fats so that you can use the lipase enzyme to break those down. Another thing the pancreas secretes that I did not put in this <coughs> is bicarbonate. Why would that make sense? Well, if the contents of your stomach enter your duodenum, remember that the contents of your stomach are pretty acidic. And so that acid is gonna trigger the release of bicarbonate from the pancreas, which is going to neutralize the acid, which is to say when acid, whoops, when acid comes into the duodenum, the pancreas is going to secrete bicarbonate to meet up with that acid in the duodenum and neutralize it because the rest of your GI tract doesn't like acidic environments. Once that's happened, you know, you've done all this breakdown stuff, that moves to the real absorptive part of the small intestine where you see mechanical digestion. That's just kind of this churning of contents in the bulk phase. You see enzymatic digestion digestion of oligomers in the bulk, or sorry, digestion by those pancreatic enzymes to oligomers in the bulk phase and digestion to monomers at the brush border. This is confusing. It's hard to put into words. We'll talk about it later. 
But once you've done that, once you've done all this enzymatic digestion, all the way to the point where you have monomeric nutrients, now you can reabsorb them. And it's the reason we don't do a lot of absorption in let's say the esophagus, because it's not broken down into monomeric form yet. Once we've broken it down into monomeric form in the small intestine, we can absorb those monomeric nutrients across the apical microvilli of those so-called enterocytes, the epithelial cells of the small intestine, and then move them to the basilar side. And now we've put those monomeric nutrients into the bloodstream, which is where we want them to be, right? That's been the whole point of all this rigmarole of developing a GI tract in the first place. And in the large intestine, there's some absorption that happens there, but we're just not gonna talk about it. It's like a very specific micronutrients and vitamins and stuff. But a lot of what happens that we care about is motility, moves things to the anus and the outside world. So that is the GI tract. That's a quick overview of everything that happens there. Now we're gonna go through step-by-step step and go through um, each individual piece. But before we do, before we uh, jump into the details, are there any questions? <coughs> okay, so I have to pause for a sec because my voice is getting kind of raspy. Let me drink some water. <clears throat> all right, so let's start. Oh, and then uh, before we do that, there's all these sphincters. Um, sphincter just means a thing that closes, that forms the barrier between two chambers. Um, the, the term sphingain means to close. So Dr. Warren and I had a long argument about whether you could say a sphincter's function is to sphinct. Suffice it, suffice it to say, the point of these is to gate passageway from one portion of your GI tract to the next. So your esophageal sphincter gates the passage from your esophagus to your stomach. Sometimes it's called the cardiac sphincter just because it's kind of near the heart, although it has nothing to do with the heart. The pyloric sphincter, um, which gates passage from the stomach into the duodenum. There's these other ones. I just put them there for completion's sake. We don't ask you to know them. Um, so I would honestly say don't write them down. Chat. What does the colon do? The, so colon is a really generic term for the large intestine. Um, so I think colloquially, like in common conversation, people will often say colon just to mean the end of the large intestine, if I'm being euphemistic. But um, yeah, it's just not really much happens there besides storage of the stuff that you're eventually going to poo out, that you're going to release to the outside world. I don't know if there's a more scientific way to say that, but whatever. The fecal matter that you're going to release of some sort. Okay. So those are sphincters. Um, just know these two up here and we'll talk about them as they come up too. So let's talk about the mouth. Again, here's all the things that we already talked about. I'm not gonna go through them because I already did, but how do we secrete things? Well, there are these glands, these exocrine glands called salivary glands that all over our face region. There's one right here, there's some under the tongue, there's some under your mandible. Um, I'm gonna skip that, it's just kind of fun, but the parotid glands, the submandibular gland and the sublingual. Don't remember those names, we just need you to know that they're exocrine glands. But the point is that they're releasing things into the mouth. They're the products of their exocrine secretion enter the mouth. And this is what one might actually look like. Um, so here is the secretory epithelium. These are sometimes called the acinar cells. Acinus means kind of like a wedge-shaped thing. These acinar cells are going to secrete their secretory products into the lumen of this duct. And the duct epithelial cells are going to secrete their stuff into the lumen of the duct as well. And imagine that this is opening in the mouth. So imagine I took out like a cube of this salivary gland and we're seeing how things would get into the mouth by way of these different epithelial cells. So here's a, a color-coded version, same exact color coding as here, but this is more what you're used to seeing, like how Dr. Walrand would draw it. And this is how that works. So you move sodium and chloride, the specific transporters aren't important. They're like the same ones that we always talk about. So just know that you move sodium and chloride across these epithelial cells in the secretory epithelium. That enters the lumen of the salivary duct. 
and water follows in a paracellular route, just like we saw in the kidney a million times, except now water is leaving your body instead of returning to it. So water exits in a paracellular route, and then your duct epithelial cells reabsorb that sodium and chloride because they don't really want to get rid of it, and they put into the duct as a kind of a replacement these ions that you're more willing to get rid of, things like potassium bicarbonate. And those exit, that's why if you test your um, saliva, you might find a lot of bicarbonate in it. But your saliva then is composed of potassium ions, bicarbonate ions, and water. And there are a couple salivary glands that also secrete mucus, which is, helps to kind of moisten the food in your mouth so that you can chew it and then swallow it easily. But that's the purpose of a salivary gland. And again, everything I just talked about here could be represented with a diagram like this. And I think this gives you a little bit better indication of how this stuff is actually moving into the inside of the mouth. And then, um, because I think it's interesting, a lot of animals don't have teeth. Uh, maybe they've evolved without them or they lost them during the process of evolution. And a lot of those animals like birds and the axolotl here will eat rocks so that when the stomach is churning, that takes care of what your mouth would do um, in breaking up that food, just like your teeth would break up food. These are called gastroliths. I just thought that was kind of fun and I'm forcing you to learn it too. Ha -ha. Okay, so that was the salivary gland. Here's the swallowing reflex. This is the motility portion. Uh, this is some kind of CT scan or something. Um, and it's to remind you that a lot of this is automatic. Once the food enters um, a portion of your mouth or a portion of your throat, so to speak, the pharynx, it's kind of whisked away without your input. Um, and everyone knows this if they've drank water, you know, you don't have to sit there and go, okay, next I'm gonna constrict this muscle of my pharynx, next I'm gonna constrict, it just happens, which is great because it takes a lot of um, that effort off of our brains. We can kind of just expect this to happen automatically. And this moves food or whatever, you know, water, fluids, anything that's in your mouth down into your esophagus, which is where you're seeing that stuff go. I keep wanting to say food, but of course, when you drink water, the same thing happens. And then this is the process of peristalsis. Um, you see smooth muscle contraction just behind the food, and that propels the food all the way down into the acidic contents of the stomach. The stomach is this kind of slurry of acid. And it's going through, it doesn't actually show it in this animation, but it's going through that esophageal sphincter um, from inside the esophagus into the inside of the stomach. So now we have arrived at the stomach what does the stomach secrete? Again, it secretes protons, hydrogen ions, and pepsinogen. And the marriage of those two things brings forth pepsin, which is to say pepsinogen is converted to pepsin only in an acidic environment. Then what, what do you do mechanically? Well, you just kind of turn the stomach contents around so that you're mixing the pepsin with the proteins that are in that food. And that turns what is mostly kind of this mushy, mostly solid thing into something called chyme, which is more of a slurry, it's more fluid-like. The enzymatic digestion, we just talked about, it's a breakdown of proteins into peptides by pepsin, and then you move that chyme into the small intestine through the pyloric sphincter. So the epithelium that lines the inside of the stomach, um, often called the gastric mucosa, is thrown into these folds. And that's just to kind of increase its surface area. That's, it's not really that physiologically relevant, the presence of these folds. We're going to dive really, really deep into the epithelium, so much so that we can't even see the folds anymore, but realize that they're there. And they sometimes are called a rugae. They just help increase the surface area. Whereas the basilar side of this epithelium is surrounded by three muscular cell layers. The innermost is the oblique, and then the circular, and then the longitudinal. I wouldn't spend too much time memorizing that if, if you don't want to, but it's there for you if you want it. Um, circular muscle tends to kind of constrict things where the longitudinal muscle is really just pushing things back and forth. I'm not exactly sure what the oblique muscle does, but there you go. So what we're gonna do 
is we're going to look at what's called a gastric pit. And they're so small that you can't even see it on this picture. So we're going to take an electron microscope and zoom in really, 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 really close to the intest or to the gastric mucosa, the epithelium of the stomach lining. And remember, we're looking at the apical side here. We're looking at the apical portion of these epithelial cells. On these epithelial cells are these things called gastric pits. And what's really great about those gastric pits is that little bits of food can fall in there. And that's actually the trigger for all of this gastric function, the secretion of, of hydrogen ions, the secretion of pepsinogen. Most of that occurs thanks to the fact that food particles fall into this gastric pit, serving as a signal that, hello, you know, we're here, food has arrived from the, um, from the esophagus. I like thinking about these things as happening, happening in a sequential order. Sometimes it's not perfect, but I think it helps me string this whole digestive system story together. So that's why I kind of talk about it like that. Um, let me know if you want me to reiterate anything as I go through it. And I'm sure I'm watching the chat. So, okay, good. So a gastric pit, again, is just an invagination of this epithelium. It creates a pit. If we were looking at it from a side view, um, so here are those pits up here. And then this is a, a cross section so you can actually see what's inside one of those gastric pits. These gastric pits are lined with a ton of different epithelial cell types. And I'm gonna try to show them as if they're all organized perfectly all the time, they're not. But I think it helps to represent them kind of where they tend to be. So the goblet cells lie on the surface of these gastric pits and these secrete mucus. Sorry, oh God, they're doing something in the apartment next to mine. Uh, the goblet cells that lie on the surface of these gastric pits secrete mucus and that helps prevent this epithelium from being damaged because the contents of the stomach up here on the apical side are really acidic, which is, you, you know, you attempt to do that both because it helps make pepsin, but also because it helps prevent uh, bacteria and stuff from proliferating too much. So these uh, goblet cells secrete mucus. The G cells, and don't worry about this big wall of text, we'll go over this in a bit. The G cells are at the very bottom of the gastric pits. These actually are the ones that supposedly initially respond to food. So food drops down into the gastric pit, turns on the G cells, and the G cells respond by releasing a peptide hormone known as gastrin. Interspersed at random intervals along the epithelium of these gastric pits are parietal cells. They're activated by a whole manner of things, one of those being gastrin. Parietal cells release acid. We'll show you exactly how, but it's worth noting that when food drops down in the gastric pit, causes the G cells to release gastrin, that gastrin travels as a peptide hormone to the parietal cells and says, hey, food is here, it's time to start making acid. Really all we'll, all we'll talk about is a really complicated system by which these things talk to each other, by which these cells talk to each other to say food has arrived, it's time to make stomach acid. The enterochromaffin-like cells um, are just next to the parietal cells. They release histamine in a paracrine fashion, which also increases acid secretion. And to make this even more confusing, they're also activated by G cells, which are activated by food. Again, it's just this really complicated way to tell the parietal cells to release um, acid. And then finally, the rest of them, I'm sure there's other ones I'm not showing, but the rest of them here are chief cells. Chief cells are constantly secreting pepsinogen. As far as I know, they don't really care when. They're, they're not deciding when to release pepsinogen. They're just always releasing pepsinogen so that there's always a bit of pepsinogen in the lumen of the stomach. And when I say release, I should say secreting. They're secreting pepsinogen into the lumen of the stomach. So let's kind of bring this all together in one big story. So let's talk about parietal cell acid secretion. Food enters the gastric pit, that activates your G cells right here. Activated G cells release gastrin, which travels in an endocrine fashion to your parietal cells and your ECL cells and increases their activity. 
whatever that activity may be. The activated ECL cells release histamine, which doesn't have to use endocrine transport. It's right next to the parietal cells. So it releases histamine in a paracrine fashion, just next to, and causes increased acid secretion from parietal cells. All of this, all of this rigmarole that I just talked about is, is upregulated by the parasympathetic nervous system. Now ask yourself why this might be the case. Well, this is the rest and digest system. This is the part of your nervous system that's mobilizing the bodily functions that would help to digest food, one of which being all of this stuff that we just talked about. So what I'm gonna do now is dive deeper into the parietal cell itself and show you exactly how that's producing acid and then show you all the different ways that that's regulated. So here's a parietal cell. Um, it has a couple of unique transporters. On the apical side, there are two important ones you should definitely memorize. You have a K plus leak channel, just like most other cells have K plus leak channels and it allows K plus to leak out. However, the parietal cell is organized in this kind of unique way such that it's closed a little bit. So the potassium concentration in what is called this blind alley increases. Even though the potassium concentration out here isn't increasing very much, the potassium concentration in this little compartment increases and that causes a gradient. Potassium then, because it builds up out here, it wants to enter the parietal cells and it drives the function, it helps to drive the function of an ATP driven proton potassium exchanger that uses both this potassium gradient as well as a little bit of ATP to kick protons out into the apical side of this parietal cell. So it's basically saying, let's push out some potassium so that the potassium will want to move back down into the cell. And part of what helps hydrogen ions get out is that movement. Um, so it's a little complicated here, but, but I'll try to go through it and bring all the pieces together in one. So when potassium comes back into the cell, it builds up again inside the cell. It's really just gonna keep cycling, right? It's gonna come inside the cell. It's gonna go back to the apical, the, apical side, come back into the cell, go back out to the apical side. It's continually building up and then releasing this potassium gradient. And every time it does that, it's kicking out more and more and more protons into the lumen of the stomach because this opens up into the gastric pit, that goes up into the stomach and that causes the stomach contents to be acidic. So there goes the proton. And then, you know, here's the recycling of that potassium. And this proton movement is important because if proton were to, if protons were to build up in this blind alley of the parietal cell, you wouldn't have this driving force for it to keep being released here. So K plus leaves, K plus, uh, H plus leaves, K plus leaks out again. I'm stumbling over my words here, I apologize. Please let me know if that doesn't make sense. And the last thing I wanna say here, kind of bringing this whole story together is where did this proton come from in the first place? You can't just keep releasing protons if you're not getting them from somewhere. Well, you're getting them from the action of that enzyme that we all know and love, carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase exists in, in good amounts inside these parietal cells. So all you need is water and carbon dioxide to come into this parietal cell Carbonic anhydrase turns that water and carbon dioxide into protons and bicarbonate. The protons are kicked out of the parietal cell, they go into the apical side, they go into the lumen of the stomach, and the bicarbonate actually goes back into the blood vessels. And so after a meal, because all of this is happening after a meal, you'll see a lot of bicarbonate ions in the blood and that's what causes the alkaline tide. If you were to measure the pH in the blood, right after a meal, you'd see that it's pretty basic. Um, and that's just a normal thing that happens because you need to somehow form these hydrogen ions. So it's a bit of an equilibrium. The more hydrogen ions you kick out into the inside of your stomach, the more bicarbonate ions you get in your blood.
and that equalizes after a bit, you know, those bicarbonate ions do something else, but that's the alkaline tide that he talks about. Again, all of this is regulated positively by the parasympathetic nervous system, activating M3 muscarinic receptors, histamine from HCL cells, histamine from ECL cells, activating H2 receptors in a paracrine fashion, and gastrin from G cells traveling in an endocrine fashion to activate G cell receptors. These are all um, GPCRs and they all positively regulate every single part of this process in some way, shape or form. I'm not drawing the full intracellular cascade. Um, I don't know it, but the idea is that all of these things are working together kind of congruously to increase parietal cell acid secretion in response to food or neurological drive that it's time to start digesting things. All right, something in the chat. How long do the effects of the alkaline tide last? I have no idea. Um, I imagine they go away, away pretty quickly. Your body's pretty good at um, kind of getting rid of any kind of imbalance. But some of that may be, you know, your, your pancreas secretes bicarbonate. So maybe some of it goes there. I don't actually know. It's a good question. Um, other mechanisms like somatostatin from D cells works to decrease acid secretion. We didn't talk about that too much, but you can imagine it would do something very similar here, but it would just inhibit all these processes rather than activate them or upregulate them. Okay, so here's my common misconception alert. I, I found this fun little gif here. Stomach acid is not actually digesting food. We, we've just gone through all this complicated language to say that stomach acid is released. Um, it comes from parietal cells. You have all these different mechanisms to activate your parietal cells, but the acid isn't actually breaking down food. It's not like it has some like super corrosive action on all those polymers. What acid does is it allows for the conversion of pepsinogen into pepsin. So the chief cells that are releasing pepsinogen and the parietal cells that are releasing acid work together. Pepsin is this major proteolytic enzyme in the stomach that converts protein into peptides. So that's what's going on in the lumen of the stomach. That's why things get digested in the stomach. It's not because of the acid itself, but rather that the acidic environment that the acid establishes allows all this pepsinogen that is kind of built up between meals to be converted into pepsin so that it can then convert proteins into peptides. And that constitutes the enzymatic digestion that occurs in the stomach. You know, all of this is happening at the same time. The stomach is churning. It's mixing the contents of the stomach lumen with pepsin and acid. And um, just to keep track of everything, sometimes that acid can come back up into the esophagus called acid reflux or gastric reflux or heartburn, even though it has nothing to do with the heart, it's just kind of near the heart. Um, that's what that feeling is. That's why if you take something like an antacid, it helps that a lot. So we're done with the stomach. You know, we finished talking about the stomach. Now we're gonna move things from the stomach through the pyloric sphincter and to the duodenum. And I wanna use this as an opportunity to say when I was a small child, I was playing with one of these toys and I swallowed one of these balls that they come with and it got stuck in my pyloric sphincter. So a good exam question, this isn't an exam question, but a good exam question could be, you know, was Davis's uh, duodenum able to respond to the acidic chyme that contained lipids, um, proteins, and carbohydrates and a bunch of other stuff? No, because there was a blockage in the pyloric sphincter for like a month. But yeah, so that's what the pyloric sphincter is. It gates the passage of all this stuff from the stomach to the duodenum. And in the interest of building this sequential story here, I want to tell you about the S cells and the I cells first, because they respond to this movement of stuff from the stomach into the duodenum of the small intestine. The S cells respond to the acidity of the incoming chyme by releasing secretin into the bloodstream. And the I cells respond to fats of the incoming chyme by releasing cholecystokinin into the bloodstream. These two things are working together 
to respond to the incoming time and they're releasing endocrine hormones, I think these are both peptide hormones, into the bloodstream and that's going to help begin the process of small intestine digestion. So what do these cells actually, what do these hormones released by these cells actually do? Secretin, which was released by S cells in response to acid, travels to the pancreatic duct cells in an endocrine fashion, you know, through the blood, and it'll cause the pancreatic duct cells to release bicarbonate. Why does that make sense? We kind of touched on it earlier, but if the contents of the, the acidic contents of the stomach enter the small intestine, cause the S cells to release secretin, that secretin goes to the pancreas, the duct cells of the pancreas, and causes the duct cells of the pancreas to release bicarbonate, that bicarbonate just goes into here in the duodenum and neutralizes that acid, again, because we don't want the small intestine contents to be acidic. So that serves as this feedback loop. The more acidic the contents of the duodenum are, the more secretin the S cells are releasing, the more your pancreatic duct cells are releasing bicarbonate. In a very similar fashion, your eye cells are releasing cholecystokinin in response to fats. Cholecystokinin activates the pancreatic secretory epithelial cells to release digestive enzymes, which is a signal, hey, there's food here, that food contains fats, let's go activate these pancreatic secretory cells to release the enzymes necessary to digest polysaccharides, polypeptides, and fats. And another thing that cholecystokinin does is it goes to the gallbladder and causes it to squeeze some bile salts um, through this bile duct here that kind of connects to the pancreatic duct, and they both empty out into the duodenum. We'll see later that the bile salts help to emulsify the fats so that your pancreatic lipase can get to work. So here's a more Walren style diagram. I've color code coded these correspondingly such that secretin interacts in an endocrine fashion with your pancreatic duct cells to release bicarbonate and cholecystokinin from your eye cells induces your pancreatic secretory acinar cells to release digestive enzymes. Again, because cholecystokinin is the, hey, there's food in here trigger. Those pancreatic enzymes are trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, lipase, and pancreatic amylase. We're gonna see that those are the important bulk phase digestion enzymes that we talk about later on. So here's the gallbladder, I, I said this already, but bile salts are made in the liver and then they're stored in the gallbladder you know, they're moved from all these tubes into the gallbladder so that when food enters the duodenum and those eye cells release cholecystokinin, that cholecystokinin can go to the gallbladder in an endocrine fashion and cause the smooth muscle around it to contract. And that squeezes bile salts into the duodenum, which aids in lipid digestion. And cholecystokinin literally means bile sac mover, which is where it got its name from. All of this is to say, you know, what's the point? Well, bicarbonate buffers the acidic chyme, amylase, trypsinogen, chyme, trypsinogen, and lipase aids in bulk phase digestion, and bile salts are required to break up fat globs into, you know, these smaller little droplets, these lipid droplets, so that the lipase from the pancreas can get to work. So I'm kind of differentiating here between the duodenum and the rest of the small intestine. It's not that clear a distinction, but suffice it to say, as we progress down the length of the small intestine, we're gonna start using these pancreatic enzymes, using these bile salts to actually get to work and digesting all this stuff. So I know that was a lot all at once and I tripped over my words a little. Um, are there any questions so far? I see one, do bile salts help the lipase? Yes, and I'll talk about exactly how in a sec. Okay. I have a question real quick. Go for it. Um, you said that the eye cell uh, secretes CCK in response to lipids, but it's releasing enzymes for um, 
to act on fats as well as proteins and carbs? Yes, exactly. Um, as far as I can understand, it's more like a, a signal that, hey, there's food here than it is, hey, there's specifically lipids here. Although that might be a little confusing because it does cause cholecystokine, um, because cholecystokinin does cause bile salts to be released. But as far as I can tell, it's, it's really just a signal that food has entered the duodenum and lipids are being used as the signal for that. I don't know why um, that tends to be the case, but it is. Sorry, I don't have a more, uh, this is how it is answer for you, but. All right, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's, it's really just a, a food trigger type deal. All right, so we've arrived at the, the small intestine. This is the thing that, it's all been working towards this point because in the small intestine, using these pancreatic enzymes in the bulk phase digestion, you can actually convert these almost all the way down into monomers. And then at the brush border, you convert these oligomers into monomers and you absorb those monomers across the apical microvilli and then you've absorbed stuff. That has been the whole point here. So the secretion um, we already talked about, that's, that's what happened in the duodenum. So here is a small intestine kind of taken apart and folded out so you can see it. It's hard to see these intestinal villi. You actually can't see it unless you have a microscope. Um, in the small intestine, there's all these folds. Don't worry about the intestinal folds. We really just care about the villi. And the villi are these big, big multicellular structures. Um, we'll see that the microvilli are smaller than that. They're actually on the cells that make up the villi. So here are the intestinal villi. The small intestine is surrounded by muscles as well that helps move things through the small intestine, but we won't name them or anything. Of course, there's blood vessels. There's always blood vessels. Uh, we'll see why that matters. And if we zoom in to these villi, right? So we're, we're diving deep into these villi. We're gonna see them for their cellular structure. Here are two villi made of a bunch of enterocytes. So here are the epithelial cells of the small intestine. They're really, really small and they have these tiny little extensions on their apical surface that make up the microvilli. So a good way to say this is that the microvilli are unicellular. They exist on the apical surfaces of, of individual enterocytes, whereas the intestinal villi are these bigger structures that, um, that you can see, you know, with a, I shouldn't say that, they're, they're the bigger structures. They're the finger-like projections um, that make up those intestinal folds. The brush border is called that because it actually looks like a brush if you look at it um, with a microscope. So in the small intestine, bulk phase digestion is gonna happen between villi. I, I don't know if this is completely accurate, but I imagine like the villi kind of playing ping pong with all the enzymes and the polymers and stuff. And remember that those enzymes are trypsin and chymotrypsin, amylase, lipase, and bile salts. I keep putting like asterisks on bile salts. I'll talk about exactly how they come into play here. But the basic idea is that all these triglycerides and, and polypeptides and big sugars are being battered around in this bulk phase by these villi. And that helps to mix them together so that they can all digest together. Once you do that, at the brush border in very, very close proximity to these microvilli, you can digest those oligomers into monomers. So let's do that. Let's zoom in here and look at the brush border itself. So here are the brush border enterocytes. This is you know, getting down to the level of individual um, epithelial cells, which are the enterocytes. And they're commonly identified by these apical microvilli, which allows them you know, a really good surface area for absorption. On these apical microvilli, you have what are called brush border enzymes. I like to think of these brush border enzymes as kind of completing the whole story. In the bulk phase, you've digested things down almost to monomers, but not all the way. You still have oligomers like disaccharides and oligopeptides and things like that. So these brush border enzymes 
are carboxyaminopeptidases. These are also called oligopeptidases. They really just break these peptides down into amino acids. And you have disaccharidases. There's a maltase, a sucrase, and a lactase. Maltase turns maltose into two glucose molecules. Sucrose turns, sucrase turns sucrose into a glucose and a fructose and lactase turns lactose into glucose and galactose. The basic idea is that you're taking these disaccharides and turning them into monosaccharides. And once you've done this, you've gone almost all the way. You've got monosaccharides and individual amino acids. We're leaving out lipids because we'll talk about that. You then use sodium-driven cotransporters, much like the ones in the uh, proximal convoluted tubule of the kidney, to move those monomers, monosaccharides like glucose and amino acids, into the enterocytes and then across the basilar side of those enterocytes into the blood vessels. And I didn't show it, but I meant to. There's also, of course, sodium potassium ATPases down here because you want to get rid of that sodium and maintain a low sodium concentration inside the enterocytes. It's pretty standard to say that there's pretty much always going to be sodium potassium ATPases on the basilar side of these epithelial cells, regardless of whether you're talking about the kidney or the gut. So you've absorbed your nutrients, except for uh, lipids, which I'll go over next. So fat globules, blobs, however you want to call them, these are the big, big lipid droplets. Um, and they form because lipids are hydrophobic. They don't really like touching water, and so they're all going to associate together. A bile salt is an amphipathic molecule that was released by the gallbladder. It was stored in the gallbladder, cholecystokinin caused their release into the duodenum. And because they're amphipathic, they are going to use their hydrophobic ends to surround the fat globules. They're going to use their hydrophobic ends to surround the hydrophobic flat fat globules. Now the, um, the bile salts, the part of the bile salts that does this, the hydrophobic portion is usually some kind of steroid. Remember that steroids like aldosterone um, are hydrophobic, they're lipophilic. So the hydrophobic portion of the bile salt is going to be the part that interacts with the fat globule that kind of breaks it up. And that's usually going to be some kind of steroid which again, steroids are hydrophobic. Once you've done this, this process of what's called emulsification, you've turned these big fat globules or fat blobs into what are called lipid droplets. Those lipid droplets are then absorbable by your small intestine enterocytes. And it's really confusing. The great thing is that Dr. Warren didn't get through it all the way. So here's what you need to know about this. These micelles, which are what these are right here, or emulsified fat droplets. They're kind of all organized into micelles. Those fat droplets are going to leave the micelles. They're going to enter the epithelial cells, across the apical microvilli, enter the Golgi apparatus, and the, the lipids, the, the triglycerides that you have broken down into fatty acids and glycerol, are going to be turned back into triglycerides in the Golgi apparatus. They're going to be transported across the basilar membrane in these complexes called chylomicrons. And those chylomicrons are going to enter what is called a lacteal, which is a lymphatic capillary. So just to go over that again, you've broken down these fat globs into lipid droplets. They become encased in these things called micelles. But then they, the fatty acids and the monoglycerides that have been made because of lipase enter the epithelial cells, complex with the Golgi apparatus, turn back into triglycerides for some reason, are complexed into chylomicrons, and then put in these lacteals. So really what the, what the bile salts were doing is breaking up those fat globs to allow the lipase enzyme that was released by the pancreas to break down those triglycerides into fatty acids and monoglycerides. Move them across, turn them back into triglycerides, move them into the lacteal. Again, I'm, I 
it would be easier for me to describe this if I could go through all the details, but you don't need to know all the details. So as long as you can just in general describe how this works, that it's not really the same story as it was with glucose and amino acids, and that the chylomicrons on the basilar side have to enter lacteals, you're golden. Why do they have to enter lacteals? Because they're big. Chylomicrons are complexes of a bunch of triglycerides. And so they're too big to fit through the spaces between capillary endothelial cells, but they're small enough to enter through the spaces of lacteal or lymphatic endothelial cells. However, those lymphatic vessels, these lacteals, go to lymph vessels. Don't read all these words. They go to lymph vessels. Those lymph vessels drain into the vena cava. So you really are just taking a different route to get back to the blood vascular system. You have to use these lacteals because the chylomicrons are too big to fit through the capillary endothelium. So they have to go through the lymphatic endothelium. But then the lymphatics drain back into the heart. So it's all back in the bloodstream. So that is the broad, broad overview of fat digestion or fat absorption, I should say. So what happens after absorption? And this, this will go really quick through because he didn't really talk about this as much, but suffice it to say, you have all these monomers in your bloodstream. Some of them you use right away. Some of that glucose and amino acids you use right away, but most of it you actually build back up into polymers because you want to store it so that you can break it down later on, um, which is why our food contains so many nutrients for us because it's building up its energy stores for itself and you're just taking that from it. So the hepatic portal system is the system of blood vessels that goes from the digestive tract to the liver. Venous blood or deoxygenated blood from the digestive system cannot just get right back into the heart. If it did, that would be a problem because sometimes you digest things that you don't want to get straight back into your blood vessels. Things like alcohol or you know certain toxins. Your liver is really good at monitoring your blood for those toxins. So you use this hepatic portal system to deliver all that stuff you've absorbed to the liver and say, and the liver basically says, okay, is it good? Is it good? Yes, okay, keep going. Or it'll detoxify some things if it deems them too dangerous. Um, so there's, there's reasons why you would want your liver to work, right? It helps you to monitor your, the stuff you've absorbed from your digestive tract for anything that might be um, harmful. So that's one of the many, many functions of the liver. Again, it also makes urea, it makes some bile salts, it makes all kinds of stuff. It makes angiotensinogen. So here's the liver. Um, I already just said all this stuff, but in the liver, you're building up stores of glycogen and albumin. Those are the ways you store carbohydrates and proteins. So you, you take all those glucose molecules you've just absorbed and you build them up into big glycogen stores, which are basically just big starches. Take all those amino acids you've absorbed and you build them up into albumin proteins and store them inside the liver. They're delivered to the liver by the hepatic portal system. Just to go back a second, reiterate, a portal system is any vessel, any blood vessel that exists between two capillary beds. So we talked about the hypophyseal portal earlier on. Here's the hepatic portal. It's between the capillaries of the digestive tract and the capillaries of the liver. That's why it's a portal system. So that's um, a bigger picture of the liver. Don't, so here's the portal triad. That's just referring to the three different types of vessels in here. You have the bile vessels, which of course you would need because you've got to get bile to the gallbladder somehow. The hepatic artery delivers blood to the liver, just like any artery delivers blood to any other organ. And the hepatic portal vein delivers this nutrient rich blood to the liver. The blood that might also contain things like toxins and things you don't want in your body. So here's a liver lobule. Uh, there, there are all these kind of hexagonal shaped arrangements of cells. If you were to cut the liver, kind of transect it 
and look down, you would see all these hexagons and each of those is called a liver lobule. Don't focus too much on the crazy details of this picture. What I want you to realize is that these portal triads that contain the bile ducts, the hepatic artery and the portal vein exist at the vertices of this liver lobule, which is that unique arrangement that you see thanks to these um, hexagons, these liver lobules. Your arterial and your venous blood here actually mix. The hepatic vein blood and the artery blood mix in what are called sinusoids. And those travel centrally towards the central vein. But as they do so, they go right up next to these cells that are called hepatocytes. So you can imagine if your hepatic portal vein is delivering some nasty toxin like alcohol, you don't want that to get to the central vein because it makes, if it makes it to the central vein, it's being dumped back into the heart and you don't want alcohol being dumped back into the heart. So these hepatocytes monitor for whatever's running through the sinusoids and they can kind of get rid of some toxins as the blood is flowing through. So that is the function of these sinusoids. They allow the, um, they allow the hepatocytes to monitor for whatever's coming in with the hepatic portal vein to make sure nothing um, unseemly is entering the central vein. Another thing the hepatocytes do is produce a lot of things. Again, like urea and angiotensinogen and bile salts. Urea and angiotensinogen will just be dumped right into the central vein, just like everything else, and they'll start traveling in an endocrine fashion through the body. The bile system is a little weirder. Bile is also made by the hepatocytes, but instead of going towards the central vein, they'll actually go towards the bile ducts through these tiny little channels called bile canaliculi, which don't really worry about that. But that bile will then travel through the bile ducts um, in this direction, and they'll be stored in the gallbladder for that eventful day that you eat something that contains fats or anything really, and it'll kind of squeeze some bile salts into the um, duodenum. So that's the liver in short form. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. Don't worry about this. I don't wanna inundate you with things you don't really need. Yada, yada, yada. So the hepatocytes, here's a, I guess a zoomed in version. They take up glucose and amino acids from the sinusoidal capillaries and they polymerize them into proteins like albumin and glycogen, which is stored polymerized glucose. All of this has happened after absorption. A lot of those monomers you don't wanna use right away. You wanna build them up in your nutrient stores in your liver. All right, I think that's it. So is there any part of that you want me to go over again? Um, any questions you have? So canaliculi is carrying bile salts and acids away from the liver. Yes, the bile canaliculi are carrying bile salts and acids towards the bile ducts, which carry bile salts and acids towards the gallbladder, where they wait for cholecystokinin to tell them to go into the duodenum. Okay, awesome. And I'll stick around here for a sec uh, if you want to ask any more questions. Let me know. Otherwise, I will see some of you tomorrow. Good luck on the exam. Can you go over the renin angiotensin? Yes, I will go over the renin angiotensin. Yeah, I have a few minutes. Um, I'll try to post this as soon as I can. Um, it, it'll only depend on how quickly it can upload. Okay, so first thing, I'm gonna go back to the renin angiotensin system and just end the show. Okay. Back to the kidneys. Oh, where are we? So the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is a really complicated way of saying the system that responds to low blood pressure and low blood volume by increasing blood pressure. It would stand a reason that if you drop 
in blood volume, you probably also drop in blood pressure. Those two things kind of go together. So the response to that is going to be to increase blood pressure. So what happens first, so to speak? Well, if your blood volume drops, the juxta glomerular cells of your kidney are going to release the enzyme renin or renin, which enters the bloodstream. While that's happening, your liver is, is almost constantly producing this thing called angiotensinogen. It's dumping that angiotensinogen into the central vein, which goes into the bloodstream, where it will make contact with this enzyme, this proteolytic enzyme, renin. I'm trying to say renin because that's technically correct, but I know Warren says renin, so whatever. Angiotensinogen is the inactive form of angiotensin. Remember that anytime you read inogen, you should hear inactive form. Just like pepsinogen was the in inactive form of pepsin, angiotensinogen is the inactive form of angiotensin. So renin converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1, and angiotensin 1 is not yet ready to actually angiotense. Remember, angio means tube and tense means to constrict. Angiotensin converting enzyme released from the lungs is going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And once you've done that, once you've converted angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, you actually see the effects of angiotensin, which are vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction and angiotensin are very similar. They, you know, they mean almost the same thing. Angiotensin is the hormone that causes vasoconstriction. By constriction, by, <laughs> by constricting the blood vessels, you are increasing blood pressure. Another thing that angiotensin II does though, is it goes to the adrenal glands, which are the glands on top of the kidneys. And the adrenal glands release the steroid hormone aldosterone into the bloodstream. That aldosterone travels in the bloodstream to the distal convoluted tube. So you can imagine here, you know, let's, uh, let's take some aldosterone, whatever. You have aldosterone in the bloodstream. It finds these distal convoluted tubule cells and it upregulates epithelial sodium channels on the apical side, these enacs, that causes sodium reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule. Water follows that sodium in a paracellular route as often happens in the convoluted tubules. And that increases water reabsorption, which also increases blood pressure. So does that answer your question? Let's see, I'm missing things from the chat. Um, awesome. So do the GPCRs on parietal cells have specific names we need to know? Let me go to that slide. Parietal cell GPCRs. Um, I would know M3 is a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. I mean, if a receptor is called H something, it's probably a histamine receptor. So you can kind of guess at that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't care too much about it, um, as long as you understand that they're all GPCRs, because all of these things are peptide transmitters of some variety. Does that help? Although acetylcholine isn't a peptide. I shouldn't say that. Acetylcholine is just released by the parasympathetic nervous system. OK, awesome. Yeah, so don't worry too much about their names. All right. Yeah, thank you. And Kendall, I think you guys, you can start asking your questions. Okay, cool. Um, since you're on parietal cells, we can start there. We were wondering about, um, I guess actually the full like intracellular upregulation of um, hydrogen ion release, because uh -huh. we're wondering kind of like the, like how each one is individually impacting it. If they're all upregulating the production of the hydrogen potassium 
co-transporters or like an ATPA says like all of that, is it channel specific? So the, the short answer is, I don't know. Um, okay. <laughs> the short answer is, I don't know, and we won't test you on that, but I know you guys probably want to know more because that helps. Yes. Okay, so, so here's, here's me venturing my best guess. Okay. Anything excitatory is going to, any, any G protein coupled receptor that responds to its agonist in an excitatory fashion is going to work either via the G alpha S pathway or the G alpha Q pathway. So the end results of that are either going to be protein kinase A activity in the G alpha S pathway or you know, cyclic A um, or calcium calmodulin kinase activity for the, the G alpha Q pathway. So those are just the, the major kinase enzymes that are activated as a result of those two major G protein coupled receptor linked pathways. Those are kinases, right? So any kinase is any enzyme that's going to phosphorylate something. So I would imagine that these proteins that I've shown here on the apical side are positively regulated by phosphorylation, which is to say somehow by phosphorylating them, that is increasing their inherent activity, that being to allow potassium ions out or to exchange protons for potassium. Beyond that, I don't know. I, I'm sure there's a lot of research into that topic. Um, I could look it up for you and, and give you a better answer, but um, maybe that's not worth too much of your time, although you're- Yeah. yeah. No, that's good. Um, cool, thanks. And yeah. then actually, I'm just curious also now that I'm looking at this oh. diagram more, um, since there, since we have a muscarinic receptor, I think I'm confused because I've always had it in my head at least that a muscarinic receptor is only going to be on muscle? Um, so no. How is that they were, Yeah, they were first identified on muscle because it's really easy to take apart a frog and look at its muscles, <laughs> but they're everywhere. Muscarinic receptors are all, all over the place. Okay, okay, cool. Um, so then let's see. Oh, we were wondering also, um, and going back to renal, where do the podocytes end? Are they only confined to Bowman's capsule or do they extend into the nephron? They're only in Bowman's capsule. So okay. more specifically, I mean, can you see my arrow? My mouse? Yeah. Okay. So more specifically, they're the ones that are actually surrounding the glomerular capillary. So you would say that these that I'm outlining are podocytes, Whereas these out here are just glomerular, are just Bowman's capsule epithelial cells. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so they're like really highly specialized. They're really, really highly specialized. Yeah, the, and I, we don't talk about this too much, but every single part of the nephron has a different, slightly different type of epithelial cell um, depending on what it does. And like- Is what, that kind of getting into like thick versus thin segments as well? Yeah, okay. the, the epithelium and the thick segment is they're just bigger cells, which is why it appears thicker. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and if then, you, oh, sorry, oh. before we move on, uh, if you want to see podocytes, um, here you go. These are podocytes, and you're not seeing the glomerular capillary because that's how extensively they're wrapping around it. But if you kind oh, okay. of imagine here, you can almost see the convolutions that you would see of a, any given capillary bed. The podocytes are just enveloping the crap out of these mm -hmm. capillaries. And all these little uh, like holes you see here. Yeah. These slits, those are the, the spaces through which things can go from inside a glomerular capillary into Bowman's capsule. Okay. Yeah. So would this be, this is looking at the apical surface then? Yeah, so, well, this is looking at, this is looking at the apical surface of podocytes, and that gets a little tricky, but it's, it's as if you, so, it's as if you took a Bowman's capsule, mm -hmm. and you, like, opened it and looked down into it. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Podocytes don't really have a, like, clear apical basilar, because they're just so convoluted. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 
that makes more sense. Yeah, when we draw them as squares, it seems like it's going to be something that's more right distinctive. But okay, he wants to like not show you these diagrams because they're complicated. But on the other hand, it makes it look cooler, and if it looks cooler, you're more likely to care. So right. Okay, cool. Um, and then we were also curious about your the recycling of urea and how it diffuses out of the nephron since we really only talked about like ion channels. Is it also using those or? Urea is a weird, weird molecule. Um, it arrives at the rena medulla just by diffusing out of the blood vessels. Um, and a lot of urea is reabsorbed in the nephron, but a lot of it is also just arriving from the blood vessels. Because remember that the hepatocytes of your liver are actually making urea. They're dumping it into the blood vessel directly. So it'd kind of be um, overly complicated to put it into the nephron and then bring it back out, um, which of course it does happen because that's kind of what the nephron does. But a lot of the urea just exists because it has arrived from the blood vessels. Now, its relative concentrations across the renal medulla is thanks to the circulation of fluid, which delivers more urea deeper in the nephron than up high. Or, sorry, it, it causes, there's more reabsorption of urea deep in the nephron than there is up high in the nephron which is why, you know, in part, why you see that corticomedullary gradient. A lot of what that gradient is, is differences in urea concentration. Oh, okay. But I'm being very meticulously, <laughs> I'm leaving things out very meticulously because it gets really convoluted because some urea is, is released. And I think a lot of students get confused because people often say that the smell of urine is the smell of urea. So students will say, oh, well, that must mean that all the urea leaves. Well, no, a lot of it stays in the renal medulla. So that's why I think that's kind of confusing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I don't, Zach, if you're on here, did that answer the question we had about recycling? I think so. Okay, cool. If you want to email me and get a better answer, you're welcome to, but it's not going to help you for the exam. Yeah, no, I think that that's probably sufficient. I just, that question I wrote down very shorthanded and was a little less specific on it because it was from yesterday. Um, cool. And then let me see here, where are we? With macula densa cells, when they're sensing, uh, when they're triggered to release adenosine, how exactly are they being triggered? And so, someone mentioned something about them like stretching. And we were, I was very unclear on that. So that's different. So what they were thinking of was the juxtaglomerular cells in the renin-angiotensin pathway. So if the, the juxtaglomerular cells kind of surround the afferent arterial, I should have drawn them here, but I didn't. They surround it right next to the glomerulus, which is why they're called juxtaglomerular cells. If the blood volume drops, then those cells are not stretched as much, and that is the signal for them to release renin. So that's when stretch comes into play. And I think that's confusing because they're right next to the macula densa cells, but that's a different um, system entirely. That is referring to the renin angiotensin pathway. So to reiterate, renin is released by juxtaglomerular cells when those cells are not being stretched, which is a signal that the, that the blood pressure has dropped or that the blood volume has dropped. Macula densa cells are a lot simpler in that the sodium just enters the macula densa cells and it depolarizes them. The more sodium there is in the macula densa cells or the more sodium there is in the filtrate, the more those macula densa cells are depolarized, the more adenosine they release, the more you constrict the afferent arterial smooth muscle. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. ATP well, so is actually a neurotransmitter in a lot of cases. I'm sorry, what, what was it? ATP is actually a, a very potent neurotransmitter. So oh, okay. it would make a lot of sense that cells that are depolarized 
have experience, so to speak, releasing ATP when they're depolarized. So the macular densus cells are kind of co-opting this function. They're saying they're using the depolarization as a signal of how much sodium there is um, in the filtrate. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The the depolarization makes sense. I yeah. I don't think we've quite made that connection. Yeah, the, the nephron doesn't really stretch too much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and then okay. it sounds like you're saying it's more about the proportion of sodium, how much sodium is entering. It's not like a threshold you have to meet to no, activate that no, system. It's it just. Sorry, go. No, it, that makes sense. It's a graded signal. Yes, it's, it's, there's no action potential, no nothing. It's the more sodium is in the filtrate, the more depolarized the macula densa cell is, the more likely you're going to release uh, vesicles that contain adenosine. Cool, thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, and then I think this is the last one we were wondering with um, the amino and carboxypeptidase. Mm -hmm. Are those separate? Yes, um, there are different types of peptidases. Mm -hmm. Some cleave. So to talk about this, let's talk about what a protein is. Protein is made of amino acids, right? Um, and there are carboxy, there's a carboxy terminus of a protein and an amino terminus because when you put these uh, amino acids together and, 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 you know, on one side of it, there's the amino terminus, on the other side, there's a carboxy terminus. So I like to think of them like amino termini, sorry, amino peptidases chew at the proteins from one side, from the amino terminus, and the carboxy peptidases chew on it from the other side. But they work together to turn big things into small things. So it's, it's as if, um, you know, it's more efficient to go at it from both ends than to just have amino peptidases or to just have carboxy peptidases. Right, so it is actually occurring simultaneously, like you're attacking it at both ends and coming toward the middle. Right. Okay, cool. And then, I, that, yeah, that was part of our confusion as if it was simultaneous. Yeah, and at that point in digestion, um, you're not dealing with big long proteins, you're dealing with what are called oligopeptides. Right. Maybe they're three amino acids long or four or five or six. When you're talking about breaking big proteins down into like big chunks, like it's, it's hard because there's so many different levels we could talk about here. Um, take a big protein with hundreds of amino acids and divide it into five equal pieces. That's kind of what pepsin is doing. Whereas these peptidases and Whereas like trypsinogen and chymotrypsinogen, they're going to break those things down into small peptides. And then these carboxy and amino peptidases are going to turn them into amino acids. So at every step, you're getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to amino acids. And so the function of these carboxy amino peptidases is really just to finish the job, so to speak. Okay, okay that makes sense. Thank you so much for all of yeah, those. Of course. Totally. You guys have a good question. All right, is there anything else before I head out of here? Well, if not, I will see everyone. I'll see some of you tomorrow and uh, good luck on the exam. Yeah, thank you.